Okay, uh, we are on the air, and uh, <clears throat> let me let me start uh, the session uh, pivoting to face uh, pandemics. Uh, I am Andrei Sharonov. I am the president of Moscow School of Management uh, Skolkovo, <clears throat> and I would like to welcome our uh, participants uh, here in the panel and uh, those who are listening and watching watching us. <clears throat> so uh, we have just a few limits. It's a uh, 43 minutes uh, to, uh, to talk uh, and uh, another important limit uh, not to be boring and uh, will be interesting, first of all, to each other. It means that probably we will be interesting <laughs> to the rest of the world as well. So uh, uh, <laughs> I, I would like I would like to ask you uh, to introduce yourself very briefly. And uh, so far we have just uh, four participants, so it's more time per each each presenter. But I ask you kindly uh, not to turn to the separate presentation, but let's do uh, rather the uh, conversation uh, interesting uh, for uh, all of us. Uh, then, then separate stage uh, statements. So, uh, please, um, let's let's start from the presentation. Um, uh, Silvano Coletti, Silvano, please. Uh, yeah, yeah. Th you was about thank yourself. You. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me today to this uh, to this event. Uh, thank you to Orazis, of course. Very pleased to be here with you all. So. Yes, my name is Silvano Coletti. I'm the executive director, so the, the uh, basically the chief executive officer of uh, Kelonia. Kelonia is a privately held institute uh, uh, located in Basel, in uh, in Switzerland. Um, by training, I'm an engineer. Uh, I'm the founder of uh, of the company. The company. Uh, basically is a spin out from a venture that I founded at the end of 90s with uh, Nomura, the Bank of Japan. And, um, and today we are working as um, a translational science and a competence center for many outstanding uh, research center and scientists around the world and also corporation involved uh, in uh, deep science uh, and technology platforms. Okay, uh, thank you, Silvana. Uh, George? Yes, hi, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, and hi everyone. Uh, thanks for getting this opportunity. I would like to say a special thanks to Konstantin Marakov, who basically introduced me to this uh, uh, amazing panel, and I got this honor to be part of it. Uh, so, George Kneisser, I'm based in, in Switzerland, um, is a partner at Decisive Capital Management. We are an independent uh, ultra high net worth investment house, uh, and we position ourselves and we uh, look at ourselves as a very disruptive way of managing our client wealth from a global perspective. And when I say a disruptive way, we look at wealth management uh, on a 360 degree. Uh, personally, I've been in the financial industry for uh, 31 years, uh, and I think the last year was an uh, instrumental year in the way we think about our business, and I look forward to sharing my experience and hear from everyone's experience. Okay, thank you, George. Let's, let, let, let's take just one minute for introduction uh, of each other. Uh, please, uh, Rogerio. <coughs> uh, thank you, uh, Andre, and, and uh, good afternoon or good morning to to all. And uh, my name is Rogerio Alexandri, so I am the, the head of the of banking for, 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 for Portugal at, at Barclays. Uh, I'm in investment banking, so I was prior to be, uh, prior to, to joining uh, Barclays, I was at Great Fuse for Sports in, in London. So, and, um, and then that's it. Very short. <laughs> okay, <laughs> very short. Thank you. Uh, Leon, please. Your turn. It's easy because uh, Barclays is so well known. Um, I, I'll try to keep my short. Um, hi, my name is Leon To. I'm based here in Singapore. I am the executive director of Damson Capital and the chairman <coughs> of Damson Group. Uh, but essentially, Damson Group is a collection of our portfolio companies in the impact investment and ESG space, everything from green logistics to advanced biotechnology. Um, so glad to be here and looking forward to the discussion. 
Uh, thank you, Leon. And uh, finally, Sonu uh, joined us. Sonu, please, a very brief introduction, and then we start our discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, Sonu Shivdasani, um, I've been an entrepreneur in travel and tourism for the last 30 years. I uh, started in when I was 25, exactly 30 years ago. We opened our first resort here in the Maldives, where I am now uh, 25 years ago, um, created a, a luxury uh, boutique brand called Six Senses, which we sold. We're now operating Suneva, which was the flagship of the brand. So Six Senses and Everson were our diffusion brands, which we sold uh, back in 2012. And now we own and operate um, our hotels here in the Maldives and Thailand uh, with Suneva as a brand. So very much focusing on luxury, our core purpose. Uh, what's the word, uh, drive engagement and passion. And um, our core purpose is uh, engaging an imaginative slow life, essentially offering our guests luxuries whilst minimizing our impact on the planet and enhancing their health. Uh, thank you, Sono. So uh, we have uh, uh, five speakers, uh, three of uh, you uh, come from financial area, one from tourism and one from uh, startup and innovation. So that's that's it. Uh, let, let's start. Uh, I tried to send you uh, some proposals. Uh, I do not insist, but probably it might be helpful for you just uh, to bear in mind uh, that uh, I'd like to, to suggest you to talk about the, uh, first of all, your personal experience uh, during the pandemic time and to touch upon uh, such uh, ideas like leadership, what happened different, how do you feel as a leader in the, in the pandemic, uh, uh, what do you think about uh, the changing uh, when we fortunately will, will come back out of pandemic, uh, what uh, we will preserve uh, as a way of living or way of doing, uh, which uh, we took uh, uh, from this time and what, what do you think about uh, ESG principles, uh, how uh, uh, this uh, works or worked uh, during the pandem uh, pandemic time and how it changes probably in the process of, of implementation. So it's just a recommendation. You could follow the main, you should follow the main topic and uh, not, not be limited uh, by, my, by my remarks. So let's start. Uh, Silvana, floor is yours. Yeah, so thank you how very much. How do you survive? So, how, what do you think about it? How you would like to continue to leave? Yeah, so in, in this challenging time with pandemic, uh, I can say that myself, me personally, but I want to say also the team from uh, from Kelonia um, learned a lot from uh, from uh, the situation. So uh, this challenging time uh, uh, bring to us... Uh, a lot of opportunities and also a new vision. Um, I don't know if uh, it's something ethical to say, but uh, of course, uh, in the very difficult time, uh, uh, the enterprise uh, discover also challenging right at the difficult times. And of course, uh, working ourselves uh, in the scientific world, because uh, more than startup uh, world, we approach uh, the R&D teams from a mid-size and large-sized uh, corporation. Um, of course, uh, we uh, found uh, a lot of challenge in the challenge, uh, trying to find solution for other corporation and also for the community. And uh, what I can say from our perspective and from our experience is that uh, uh, we tried to bring to the community our knowledge, our know-how, uh, proposing solutions. So you have to, to, to understand that uh, we are engineers, uh, 
we are physicians, uh, we are physicists, and what what we did basically is uh, tr try to build the project uh, also to find a solution against coronavirus, against the pandemic. Uh, and uh, what we did is uh, to put in place uh, some consortium of corporation, international uh, European corporation, in our case, uh, and also research centers, uh, um, um, building s something that we call the collective scientific enterprise. So collectively, we build some new approach to the business, uh, find a new solution, specifically in our case to, to COVID. And uh, I can mention to you probably the most visible project uh, and consortium we are working on today is Escalate for Cov. Escalate for Cov uh, is a project that is uh, trying to exploit uh, the best computing resources available in Europe. Uh, um, for the finding of uh, uh, new therapeutic candidates against coronavirus. And uh, we uh, bring with ourselves uh, many small, medium enterprise and also research centers that, of course, alone, they were not able to challenge the problem of coronavirus. So we are working now with supercomputers. Uh, we are working now with uh, top scientists, uh, and so this is the uh, the lesson that we probably in a future uh, showcase uh, we can bring. So the uh, work collectively also in uh, a challenging time like the pandemics uh, is probably a solution for the companies and for the business. Uh, thank you, Silvano. Uh, of all these, all these activities and project, uh, uh, did it happen just uh, after the beginning of uh, pandemic, or you have some preliminary agreement or uh, lasting uh, research project uh, far before uh, the pandemic, or it happened like this uh, in March or April or May yeah. last year? No, we escalate for cup just to give you an example. So, uh, has a progenitor that is a platform uh, for in silico drug discovery. Uh, and this platform was developed from uh, uh, some corporation together with us, with the Politecnico di Milano in Italy, with Cineca, that is uh, uh, an inter universitary uh, consortium. Uh, of, uh, of, uh, supercomputers uh, and also with any, the oil gas company, for instance, uh, involved mm -hmm. in the project. Uh, uh, so in some way, the network uh, was already there. The platform was already there. At some point last February 2020, we were in the position also to answer an urgent call to the European Commission, uh, looking for solution to the pandemics. And so, we uh, we did our best uh, uh, in a very quick time to design a project uh, potentially available in a short time for the community and trying to find solution for for the coronavirus. That's what uh, what happened. So I see. And what is the current current result uh, you could mention from this project? So from the from the project, the results are uh, tremendous because today we have uh, one molecule that is uh, raloxifen, a drug active molecule already available in the market, uh, but that uh, no one knows about the fact that it is active against uh, COVID, against uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so basically, with the supercomputer and artificial intelligence, in a very short time, so I can say in weeks, we uh, select, we screen the billions of molecules available in the market, and we selected the raloxifen. And we tested uh, in vitro and in vivo, so in the wet laboratory, let me say, uh, just to be easy, uh, in the wet laboratories, uh, uh, we uh, uh, tested the, 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 this molecule, and we enter in a clinical phase. So last uh, July 2020, the national regulatory bodies uh, 
uh, approved the the, uh, the start of uh, clinical trials with this raloxifen. We are now in a phase two, three, so we expect to have a very positive result uh, by next summer. So the the, the molecule is uh, will be a drug uh, potentially active. Uh, for mildly infected patients. So it, it's an alternative to the, to, the, to the vaccine or an approach, uh, in a therapeutic approach, uh, uh, for instance, for people that cannot take uh, the vaccine, because of course you know that uh, there is a, a, a part of the population because it, there are some problem uh, uh, with, uh, with this kind of treatment that cannot take this and they have to go to navigate this pandemic maybe the first two, three months. And I stopped using it because I think you just have to embrace it. You have to embrace the shake and embrace what this disruptive way of things that the pandemic has accelerated. I personally, I was based in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm not a U.S. citizen, and I used to work for J.P. Morgan. And I resigned in January, uh, end of January 2020, last year. And I was supposed to leave and come back to Geneva because I signed with this uh, family office and we're, we're building our business. And uh, March 13, I was at the airport in Los Angeles when the president announced the travel ban. So I just took, I was checking in and I wasn't able to travel. So I stayed in Los Angeles until August. Uh, and for three months, I lost my visa. I was kind of with no paper. So we had to work with lawyers at least to try to put things into perspective. And the business, our business is a relationship business, is traveling, is meeting people, ultra high net worth. The face-to-face -face is very important. So I think uh, the way we looked at it, uh, and the reason I say three months challenges, because we, the way we look at it, we think the pandemic has created a stress test on individual, on couples, on families, small businesses, mid-sized business, large businesses, government, state, it stresses everyone. And I don't call it pressure, because I think pressure, we live everyday pressure. This time, it's tested our capability, how we are positioned, how we think, how we, how we navigate challenges, which for me was the first three months. So we started from the basic, because <coughs> December, January, it took us maybe 30 minutes every time going into Zoom to understand and I'm, I'm giving small examples because I think this is really makes a big difference. Just to navigate how you mute, how you share screen. It was a big, big mess to understand it. And we had no choice than overnight, take the time, we learn it. So we started as a team. We are 62 people. First thing, how you sit, how you face the screen, what is your background? How would you look? We, we did some like, you know, fine tuning to make sure we use this tool in a very efficient way. Second, we stopped complaining. And I found this is impressively refreshing. Because if you come to anyone, you say, you know, my job is challenging. Leon will say the same. Silvano will say the same. Roach, everyone will say, one second, the whole world is in the same situation. So I realized and I observed people start complaining. So we stop saving the day. We start seizing our limitation. And it, I found that it created a massive amount of creativity and innovation to deal with it. So we had, I think, one of the first examples. We are building our early stage venture capital in San Francisco. In March, I met someone over the private equity and VC in the U.S. on a webinar. We connected. We never met face to face. And we found a common denominator to build this business. I came to Geneva, we had maybe 100 Zoom calls with this person. Calls, what's up, deep dive. Now we are, as, we, as I speak, we are finalizing the deal. We put, we seeded the fund, 25 million. It's a large amount with someone you have never met with. We're finalizing the contract. We're putting millions in budget to build this business. And we've done everything through Zoom, through what's up, and through sharing experiences. And I found, I found it very efficient. 
I am I am a believer in disruption, and we embraced it. And we had we had no other option than to think outside the box and sometimes go inside the box because you find the solution in fact inside the way you are handling it. So it was a very very important experience for us, and it was a confirmation basically that we adapted and we managed the stress in a way that we were all coordinated. So from a leadership perspective, what I found as well very interesting, I found as sometimes that it become in fact more efficient when you give certain mandates, certain follow up. There was this exchange rather than just do it and then come back to me next week. So we built an ecosystem where we track performance and execution on certain things in a more efficient way. And I would add additional point on uh, on sustainability and I found the impact on what we have done. If we have done it before the pandemic, we would have at least traveled maybe 10 times to Los Angeles. Think about your trip, the hotel, everything around it to do exactly what we have done over Zoom call. And you add to it, and I'm sure Leon would understand that, even doing DD on private market or investment opportunities, you used to travel, meet the manager, one week or 10 days travel to maybe do 10, 15 meetings. Now per day, we are able to do due diligence and deep dive and ask the manager and go back and forth in doing this business. So this is one part, I think, of how we adapted to it. Of course, it will never replace the face-to-face. -face. Of course, you know, feeling, seeing the person, their action, they, how they, it's, it, it will never be replaced. So I think moving forward, it's going to be a combination of both. And we embraced it. We asked different questions. Today, if you're telling me, listen, I'm traveling to meet this person, I think as a leader, you are going to ask additional question. We, we use George, uh, yes. I, I need to interrupt you because of the time uh, time limit. Uh, by the way, if you see, we have a few questions. Uh, I, uh, I see five, but probably uh, we will ask uh, one more speaker and then we will uh, come into questions. Uh, uh, so, Requirio, okay. uh, please, uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, 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 I would like to, to first of all, to, to, to share uh, George's uh, um, view on, on a couple of things. In its, uh, we have faced a number of, of changes, uh, challenges, and, uh, and that's exactly the word is a challenge. Um, when back in March of last year, one year ago, we uh, are about 80,000 worldwide. Um, a number of uh, ways of of creativity. We have to to be creative in order to answer a number of questions that we had to put to ourselves. One, I mean, I, I'm just in, I'm going to outline it instead of elaborating it because the time is short. But I mean, things like team building. I mean, how do you? Keep, keep the team building during when everyone is at home. The, the thing is, uh, and as those related to banking are more familiar with, uh, and in, particularly in investment banking, you need creativity. And, and this coffee shop, uh, sorry, the coffee station uh, break, the coffee station dialogue, the, the, the informal relations, the the creativity that gen it's originated during these uh, short events. I mean, it's very important. Unintended, short unintended events. Short unintended events. So it is something that actually has disappeared overnight. Um, the other thing that we also faced as a challenge, or, or and we had to reinvent ourselves, is how do you integrate the new joiners? People join because, as you know, in, in, in this industry or in this part of the of the uh, of, uh, in this industry, um, there is some some attrition. 
And therefore, people carry on being integrated. People carry on. People leave. People join. And how do you integrate the, jo the new joiners? So that's one thing. The other thing is, all of a sudden, you need to keep focus. How do you keep the focus of the team? How do you boost morale? How do you motivate them for action? And not only for once, but continuously. So it's not... You can motivate one person, one team for a specific task for, okay, fine, you need to do this now because we have to all to get back to, to the drawing board and do it, but continuous motivation, continuous morale boost. It is extremely important and keep performing. Uh, and one thing that Georges also mentioned, and, uh, and I totally agree, he is, um, the financial business is a people's business, irrespective of what you say. And all of a sudden, we stop traveling. We stop seeing our clients. We stop having lunch. We stop having dinner. We stop going to the football. I mean, whatever. So the, in, the personal interaction, all gone overnight. How do you keep the service? How do you keep the excellence? How do you keep transmitting to people all this? And of course, we had to learn very, 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 very fast how to use the tools we are using now. Our first conference, my personal first conference at Orasis was in Cascais, face to face, nearby the sea, by the beach, fantastic. But now it's at home looking at you on a screen. So it's a totally different, completely different. It's my, my case as well. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, and just this pandemia is a disruptive event for the future. Our future is not going to be the same irrespective of what's going to happen with, uh, with, uh, with, um, uh, with Silvanus uh, medicine or uh, with the vaccines or whatever. I mean, this is a treat. This is a disease that is behavioral. So, I mean, if you don't behave, you get infected because it is neither vaccine nor, nor medicine for it. So, and having said this, if you look on the other side of the coin, you see the cost savings in traveling, the cost savings in hotels, time consuming, the energy in lifts going up and down on a, in a building of 31st or 32th floor. Uh, stories, I mean, you have six or seven lifts, elevators, depending on whether in English or in the US. Rogero, sorry, but uh, in the same time, you see the loss of uh, profit uh, for okay. hotels, uh, for transportation, yeah, and all this. That's stuff. exactly it. So, this is that's why the other side is. of the coin. Yes, the other side of the coin. So, the thing is, it's very good, but the consuming of paper. I mean, you don't like the nature. Example. So the thing is, in this situation, that's why it is disruptive because the business model or the paradigm is going to change, and people need to adapt. So the business travelers who were the most profitable passengers for airlines will disappear. I mean, or will reduce dramatically in yeah. the future. I mean, the hotels for the highest rates that they would charge us is for, for people like us who travel quite a lot. And by the way, we need to stay one more night. I mean, and there is no discount. I mean, come on, you have to stay one more night and the flight is the next flight. You miss the flight. You have to, you have to rebook the flight probably in, in, in another airline because it's the one that puts you where you need to be at the time that you need to be there. So, and the price is not the same as you going flying back and back and forth with the same company as we all know. So. That's why the paradigm is going to change. The office space is going to be reduced. So there are a number of consequences and lessons to be learned out of this pandemic once it goes away, because it will go away as the, the other one 100 years ago went away as well. So, uh, and that's, uh, and that's uh, I have a couple of things to say, but I mean, time is up. Okay. Uh, thank you, Algeria. Uh, yes, we are quite uh, squeezed by time. Uh, interesting, interesting conclusion about disruption. It's uh, the, probably the most popular word now 
during and after the yeah. pandemic or during the pandemic we're still in. Yeah. Uh, and the, the question is how to manage uh, to, to do the disruption uh, rather positive than negative because uh, uh, it brings uh, all these uh, possible consequences. Uh, so please, uh, Leon, floor is yours. Um, thanks so much. And, and thanks so much for, for all the sharing so far. I think it's, it's really, um, you know, very insightful in hearing all the different perspectives. Um, so maybe, uh, let me, let me capture my takeaways from COVID in two stories, right? One, uh, for us at Dams and, uh, you know, very much hearing also Sonu's, uh, story, you know, for us, uh, purpose and, and, and profit, you know, very much married together for us. So it comes through in a lot of our products and our, our companies. So, for example, one of our lifestyle fashion brands is uh, a jewelry brand that's ethically and sustainably sourced and only hires adults with autism. And I think one of the most interesting things about, you know, the pandemic was how it's actually um, affected very marginalized communities who we generally don't see uh, in the space. And I think, um, you know, in, in that sense, it affects people very, very differently. So, for example, uh, with our adults with autism who've never had employment before and living with us, uh, working with us, sorry, um, you know, if they actually stopped working with us, they would actually have a very, very poor response um, uh, physiologically because they are actually being disrupted on their routines. And routines for a lot of us is very flexible, but for, for these individuals actually are extremely different and it can be very, very uh, painful as well if they stop doing their own structured work. And so that's quite interesting because, um, you know, what we um, something that technology can bridge but at the end of the day, it's really about how we can step up and manage that. So that takeaway for me was really the fact that, you know, with COVID, you know, I think we found and discovered a lot of the limitations that we've had as a society in dealing with people and as leaders, also the variety of people that we have at the table. And the interesting thing about it is that we're only, especially for us in Asia, we're only as good uh, and we're able to recover as much as our weaknesses are and our vulnerable communities are. And they, we can support those individuals the best. That actually elevates the entirety of the nation because in science, as we had with our biotech company, you know, the, the ability to spread is so quick, right? Uh, if, if you had, you know, one person who was back out, like for example, Melbourne, all it took was one family out on quarantine and suddenly the whole wave started again. So I think I think that that's really the one of the, the biggest takeaways. And second of all was really in in the in time of pandemic, you know, there's uh, especially with um, communities who have a lot of options and choices. Uh, that's great. But I think you know one of our companies in in Indonesia where we have the largest green logistics company in the last mile delivery, we don't use any fossil fuel, but we hire youth at risk, marginalized youth, and youth with disabilities. And because of that philosophy, we had to really rethink about the, the space of frontline workers and try to understand what is the philosophy of their uh, position uh, you know, on the front line. You know, do we protect them or how do we protect them? Because if we stop, nobody's going to get food as well. So we were trying to figure out um, really with the principle of how do we create communities and spaces of safety overnight? You know, not just from the fact that they have masks, they have gloves, so they have, um, you know, um, the, uh, you know, uh, make sure that they're you know, cleaning, you know, every surface that they, they are uh, going around with. But also the fact that, you know, there were safeties around, um, you know, thefts on the street where, you know, people were actually targeting um, a lot of our logistics um, couriers just for the fact that they, they have packages and potentially food which could ail individuals who, who weren't being supported. So I think that that's, um, you know, just uniquely the, the takeaway for us was really about, you know, the constant ESG perspectives that we need to have on people and how do we actually continuously protect and support them, but not only support them, but in a time of pandemic that we had to really inspire them to continue going out at a time where they've been you know, given a huge amount of fear on the day-to-day -day life just by going out. 
And so we had to re-engineer the whole thinking around how do we not only protect, how do we make it safe, and also engage them in a way where they are inspired and just as motivated to give back to society by going out and just doing their job every day. And so that, that was really interesting uh, takeaways for us. I know the time is running out. I'm getting the, the little pop-up, so I'm going to stop right there. Uh, thank you, Leon. Uh, so, uh, uh, please, Sono. Sono yeah. joined us. Uh, you do represent the industry very suffered uh, from the pandemic and still suffering. Uh, please tell how, how do you feel and how do you see uh, the next day? Yes, um, in, in our particular case, we're quite fortunate. So um, Rogerio uh, very um, uh, correctly highlighted the challenges that um, corporate and city hotels aiming at corporates um, will fare because of the, the, the sort of permanent drop in corporate travel. Um, we're in resorts. Uh, we're very fortunate. We're blessed. Uh, we're, we're, we're in the Maldives in Thailand. In the Maldives, we're one island, one resort. Um, so we, we actually have been testing everyone extensively on arrival. Um, all our guests, uh, they're asked to isolate for just six hours uh, until we get the results. Our employees are tested extensively on, day, on the arrival, uh, even if they come from a COVID-free island in the country, and then on day six uh, as the check, and then once more on day 14. So we're testing ex extensively. We've created COVID-free environments. The Maldives government have realized how important tourism is to the country, and they opened up the uh, borders as soon as they could. So uh, ironically, we've had, um, we're about double on what we did last year, uh, these last few months. So um, we're actually up on a normal year. We've been a beneficiary of this current situation, the structural change, because um, there are, people are concerned. And the fact that the Maldives comprises 1,200 isolation centers in a way, and we're at one island, one resort in our properties, with extensive testing has given a lot of people reassuring. So in terms of, you know, reacting to the crisis, um, like many crises, um, it's, it's always the same. I, I'm, I'm 55 years old. I've been in business for 30 years uh, as an entrepreneur, and I've gone through many crises, and especially in travel and tourism um, in, in Asia. Um, I'm reminded of the French author um, who described 19th century Europe um, as la paix, uh, as a description of 19th century Europe, he said, la paix, la peace, c'est l'intervalle entre les deux guerres, the gap in between two wars. And in a way, um, that's been the case with our industry since um, the 2000s. You know, we've, uh, the good times have been the gaps in between crises, whether it was the Asian financial crisis in 97 and then 9-11 uh, and then SARS and um, uh, the global financial crisis. So um, we've gone through many and I, um, I sort of tend to found that The first couple of weeks are uncertain. And um, uh, George mentioned, you know, after a couple of months, you stop talking about challenges. Um, my, my view is that there are a couple of weeks where there's uncertainty. You're firefighting, you're, you have sleepless nights. You sometimes wake up in the middle of the morning with an idea and um, you're communicating a lot because you have to communicate. And it's important to communicate what you, you know, what you don't know. And you need to be very, very clear. And you have to explain what you can do and what you can't do. And, um, and, and move on. A lot of extra communication, a lot of firefighting, a lot of juggling. Um, but, you know, at some point you find a plan, you find a solution and you move forward. And um, I, I'm heartened by the words of uh, Lao Tzu, uh, good fortune has its roots in disaster. That was his view. And I had a serious health crisis two years ago. And um, Um, I like the Chinese word for crisis. It's two characters. One is danger and the other is change and opportunity. So I think once you address the, the danger, uh, which happens in the first few weeks, and then you've got a plan, you start to find opportunities. Um, and as I think as, um, uh, as, um, uh, as it is touched upon, Stefano, it's, um, it's uh, Silvano, sorry. It, it's, it, it, it is, um, it, you know, there are pandemics bring out the best of companies and, um, And, and that's been the case. So we've been um, beneficiaries in a way. Uh, we had to react quickly. We had to move forward. We had to work together with the government to, re to explain to them that tourism was very important. In the Maldives, the first person who died was 85. In 1980, before tourism started in the country, it's only 40 years. Uh, and this is what I had to, uh, what I explained was 
40 years ago, uh, the life expectancy in the country was 45 years without tourism. It was the poorest, one of the 20 poorest countries in the world. Today, with tourism, the life expectancy is 75. So the first, first person who passed away through COVID, unfortunately, um, you know, I'm obviously very, very sad for the family, did still live longer than they would have if the Maldives had been without tourism. And I think we all realized that very quickly. And that's why we opened our borders. We created a balance between it was a tricky.